Case number five, three week old with a neck mass and torticollis. Most likely diagnosis, lymphoma, fibromatosis, coli, rhabdomyosarcoma, or non-separative adenopathy. Very good. Fibromatosis coli. Which is the imaging modality of choice if the referring clinician calls you and says, what should I do if I suspect fibromatosis coli? CT, ultrasound, or MRI? this room probably don't do ultrasound, but that's the imaging modality of choice if it's referred to you. We need to recognize what they look like because frequently that's not what is done. You typically see this is a longitudinal image in the neck. This is sternocleidomastoid muscle, fusiform enlargement. It moves with respiration and you shouldn't have much um, adenopathy with it. These kids present in the first couple weeks of life. Not sure why, but they have a neck mass and um, torticollis in about 75% of patients. They have their ear tipped to the ipsilateral shoulder and their chin tilted the other way, sort of a cocked robin appearance. They may get bigger over the next few months, but most regress with physical therapy. Rarely, they have such bad torticollis that they get skull-based deformity and need to have the SCM clipped. Ultrasound, fusiform or focal enlargement to the SCM. Here's a coronal T1-weighted image with diffuse enlargement of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And, and a typical but not uncommon feature, if you do MR in these patients, is variable signal intensity on T2. They can have bright signal, and they can also have some patchy contrast enhancement, which does not mean it's a rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. Oops. Case 6, a 3-year-old with sudden onset of neck mass, post-contrast CT. The most appropriate diagnosis is first branchial apparatus cyst, second branchial apparatus cyst, lymphatic malformation or abscess. We've now moved out of the solid masses and into the cystic. Very good which are true about lymphatic malformations. They're rare in the head and neck. They rarely undergo spontaneous hemorrhage. In the head and neck, they're almost always associated with chromosomal abnormalities, or they may increase in size in association with an upper respiratory infection. Very good. They may increase in size with the URI. There's lymphoid follicles within this. So as you get your URI, you get your stuffy nose, you get your lymphadenopathy, uh, you get enlargement of the lymphoid follicles, you get extra um, increase in size of your lymphatic malformations. And they do like to hemorrhage. These are congenital vascular malformations. They grow commensurate with the child. They may be unilocular, multilocular, in one space. They love to be transpatial. They like to cross boundaries. If you see a vex, Little bit of enhancement at the periphery or septations. If you see any more than a little bit of enhancement, you have to think of another lesion, particularly a venous malformation or a mixed lesion of a lymphatic and venous. Most of these patients do not have the syndromes associated with lymphatic malformations. Three different patients, one with a fairly unilocular, couple little internal septations isolated to the supraclavicular um, space, multilocular, Transpatial, growing into, splaying the carotid sheath vessels, a little bit of increased density here, little fluid level, and an isolated one that actually just appeared within two days of imaging, fluid, fluid level with dependent blood products. So an extensive lymphatic malformation identified on a prenatal scanning, and this is postnatal MRI, a lot of hyperintense T1 um, blood products with fluid, fluid levels dependent blood in the um, multilocular microcystic and macrocystic lymphatic malformation on the T2-weighted images. 
This is a patient with a mixed venal lymphatic malformation, primarily lymphatic under the chin, anterior to the thyroid and trachea, and primarily venous involving the tongue. And this is not uncommon. This is probably a little bit of lymphatic involvement and then primary venous involvement and bilateral uh, peripharyngeal disease. Case number seven, eight-year-old with a neck mass, post-contrast CT. Most likely diagnosis is cystic schwannoma, second branchial apparatus cyst, third branchial apparatus cyst, separative node or first branchial apparatus cyst. Very good. This is an uncommon appearance to the most common branchial apparatus cyst, which is, quote, second. I'm just going to tell you the answer to this one so we can catch up on time. Most, or the second, quote, unquote, second branchial apparatus cyst is actually made up of components of the second, third, and fourth branchial class. The second branchial arch overgrows those three clefts and forms what's called a cervical sinus of his. And the cervical sinus of his remnant is then what gives rise to the second branchial apparatus cyst. So I like to call them branchial apparatus cysts instead of branchial cleft cysts. Then I don't have to remember whether it's an arch derivative, an ectodermal cleft derivative, or a pharyngeal pouch derivative. Remember, we can get a cyst, a sinus tract, or a fistula in these anomalies. Seconds are the most common. They are anywhere along this tract, usually anterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. This is the Bailey classification of second branchial apparatus um, anomalies, and type B being the most common, posterior to submandibular gland, anteromedial to SCM, and anterolateral to the carotid sheath. This one has a bit of an enhancing rim presented with symptoms of infection. And then this is the next most common second quote unquote, and that's where it beaks in between the internal and external carotid artery. First anomalies, remember, are in and around the ear. Anytime you see something around the external canal, in or next to the parotid gland, and actually even extending as low as the angle of the mandible. Here's a patient on MR with a uh, cyst adjacent to the cartilaginous portion of the external auditory canal. He had a little tiny tract and then another cyst way down at the angle of the mandible in A-type 2, first apparatus anomaly. Quick uh, tour through third and fourth. Thirds are very uncommon and in the upper neck can be in the posterior um, cervical space. Phimopharyngeal duct remnant is a remnant of the third pouch. Similar to thyroglossal duct cysts, anywhere along the tract of the thymopharyngeal duct, you have remnants of that tract. They secrete fluid and you can have thymic cysts, and you can have aberrant thymus. Here's a patient which isn't so difficult because his extended from the skull base to the upper anterior mediastinum. They like to splay the carotid sheath vessels at the skull base. And then the fourth anomalies, a remnant of the fourth pouch, these patients present with recurrent thyroiditis. Phlegmonous mass anterior to the thyroid. After treatment with antibiotics, a fistula on a barium swallow, and I like to do the post-barium swallow CT to prove the barium within the um, tract anterior to the thy um, thyroid. We're going to skip the thyroglossal duct. Remember, it goes from foramen cecum, wraps around the hyoid and down to the thyroid, so you need to do the cyst trunk procedure, remove the whole tract. And this is my summary slide of first, second, third, fourth, thyroglossal duct, and thymopharyngeal duct remnants. So we've done the vascular lesions. You've got a vascular malformation, or you have an infantile hemangioma, which is a neoplasm. And we've gone through a few benign and malignant solid masses, as well as cystic masses. Thank you.